بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's a pleasure for myself to welcome you all to this discussion this informal interview with our respected Sheikh Mufti Muhammad ibn Adam al-Kawthari wherein, wherein we'll be inshallah asking him about his life about the different aspects of his service to this deen his student life and inshallah some of his thoughts on various different topics ta'ala an extremely beneficial we pray that it'll be an extremely beneficial discussion for everyone bi'ithnillah so i'd like to begin by firstly saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you sheikh wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh jazakallahu khairan for taking out your time today uh, to allow us to take this interview inshallah um, I'd like to begin by asking yourself if you can briefly introduce yourself, your name, uh, where you were born, your, speak briefly about your parents, etc. Bismillah okay. ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa man wa wa ba'd. I would like to uh, welcome all the viewers and say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh to, to, to all of you as well. Jazakumullah khair for uh, this very important discussion that we're going to be having today. I want to try to make this as informal as possible, inshallah. Not very uh, intensive. It's also the holiday period, so I think people want a bit of informal discussion in the holiday period. Um, so, in regards to this first question, in terms of uh, myself or well, you've asked about my name <clears throat> and the details about myself etc um, you've already mentioned my name so uh, my name is only Muhammad first of all you know I, I get this quite often that people sometimes forget they say everything else and they forget Muhammad some say Mufti Ibn Adam, Mufti Adam, Sheikh Adam, Mufti Kothari I don't know all sorts of different ways people have said different things in different places and I remind them that the most important part of my name is Muhammad mm -hmm. which is the name of our messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam my father only kept my name Muhammad only Muhammad Muhammad Ibn Adam the son of Adam my father's name is Adam and you know all humans are Ibn Adam I remember once uh, there was some brother an Arab brother a sheikh I think it's been a long time <clears throat> so when he asked me what's, what's your name I said, my name is Muhammad bin Adam. So he said, Kulluna abnau Adam. We are all the sons of Adam. So I said to him, well, Ana ibn Adamain. I'm the son of two Adams. Adam alayhi salam as well as my father. So that's why I like to keep my name Muhammad ibn Adam. Muhammad, the son of Adam. And I think we should all try to use this as often as possible. You know, the, the, the whole uh, lineage Ibn or Bint, mm. Ibn such and such or Bint such and such. It's really important. In some cultures you have this. In the Arab culture, I think it's used more often than other cultures. In the subcontinent, it's not used as often. People use surnames. They have surnames, even, even in the West people have surnames, but India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, in the subcontinent, people have surnames. So they have their first name and a surname. No problem, use the surname, and we need surnames, but I think the father's name and having Ibn in between, or if not Ibn in between, at least have the father's name, I think it's really important. And also another thing is, is having a kunya, a title, which is also the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the sunnah of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and the tabi'oon, and all our classical imams and salaf al-salihin, they used to all have these kunya, Abu such and such, Abu Abdullah, my kunya is Abu Abdullah. Because my son's name is Abdullah, so I try to use Abu Abdullah. And actually, for that, I actually thought about, you know, uh, before naming my son, I was thinking about who from the great personalities in the past have the kunya Abu Abdullah. Uh, kunya means the honorific title. Mm. Um, so, who from the past imams have the title kunya Abu Abdullah? And at the same time, they have the name Muhammad. Because I wanted. My son's name, Abdullah is a good name anyway because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Inna min ahabbi asma'ikum ila Allah ta'ala Abdullah wa Abdurrahman One of the most beloved, from the most beloved names to Allah is Abdullah and Abdurrahman 
So that's why I, I like the name Abdullah, the slavehood and uh, Ubudiyah in there as well. Um, and my daughter's name is Safa. She might get upset if so why didn't you mention my name? Uh, Safa is my daughter's name. So anyway, I Kunya, I, I thought about uh, who, whoever from the past Imams have the Kunya Abu Abdullah and also the name Muhammad because my name is Muhammad. And when I looked at the list, I found some amazing, unique personalities. First of all, Imam Al Bukhari. Imam Abu Abdullah, Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari. Uh, Imam Shafi'i, his Abu Abdullah, Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i. Uh, Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan in the Hanafi Madhab, his Abu Abdullah as well. Uh, Imam ibn Majah is Abu Abdullah and Muhammad as well. And then the one who authored the Burda, he's also Abu Abdullah and Muhammad uh, al-Busiri. Um, and many others. You know, there was there were many people, uh, and Abu Abdullah itself, Imam Ahmed was called Abu Abdullah, but he was Ahmed. Imam Malik was Abu Abdullah, but he was Malik. So Abu Abdullah is a very um, unique and a very widely used kunya. So anyway, um, so my name is Muhammad bin Adam. Abu Abdullah is the kunya, the title, uh, the honorific title. <clears throat> I was uh, born here in the city of Leicester, UK. We are in Leicester Sharif, as they say. Uh, people from outside, they call Leicester Sharif and Bradford Sharif. But for those outside of the UK, Leicester is in the central part of UK. It's what we call Halatul Etidal. It's the balanced land of UK. Uh, it's not really high up north, it's not south. That's why whenever it's really extremely hot, you know, throughout the UK, we don't get those exceedingly hot temperatures here in Leicester. When it snows heavily everywhere in the UK, we don't get that extreme heavy uh, mm -hmm. snow. It's right in the middle, Midlands, and that's why it's a very kind of khairul umur al satuha best of places, best of things are the you know the middle way. So Leicester is a it's a great city, alhamdulillah. So I was born in the city of Leicester. Um, I grew up here. I was raised here. My father. Um, you know, you know my father, of course, and you know some of the brothers here. The students all know, but there's people outside, you know, who probably don't know of my father. Uh, my father, Sheikh Mulana Adam, Hafizahullah Taala. He's 85 years of age, I think, going on to 86, and he's a very old, you know, serving Imam, originally scholar, teacher of Hadith. Uh, spiritual guide to a lot of people in the city of Leicester and in, in Leicester like he is probably the most well-known and most respected at the moment especially because is the most senior um, so but there are people outside of Leicester sometimes especially the younger generation those who don't speak Urdu etc they're, they're not too familiar with him or know of him I've seen some places on online people They've mentioned my father and they've said father of you know my name with it. So um, Alhamdulillah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him well being. He's very old and fragile now and you know uh, frail. He's got a knee issue, he can't walk properly, he's on you know on his wheelchair, etc. But he came here in the nineteen seventies, around nineteen seventy six I think. He is originally from the subcontinent, from India. And that's why my ethnic background is India. Some people ask me as well, what's your background? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that I'm originally from Pakistan because I'm always talking about Pakistan. For me, these borders don't really matter. It's like whatever. But uh, originally, ancestors are from India. And India, Pakistan, it was all one before Bangladesh. It was all one anyway. So he is originally from India. And uh, he studied there. And alhamdulillah, he's, he became, uh, he graduated from the famous Dar Ulum Deoband uh, seminary, which is in, in Deoband. And he studied by some great shuyukh. He's, he's, he's seen people like Sheikh al-Islam, Awlana Hussain Ahmed Madani, Rahimahullah, uh, and also some students of Imam al Rashid Kashmiri, Rahimahullah. His, one of his teachers was Qari Muhammad Taib, Rahimahullah, the student of Hakim al Umma Mulana Shari Taib, Rahimahullah. So a lot of senior people, and that's why even Hadith Ijaz right now, he, He's got some high asanid which a lot of people don't have right now and that's why there's a lot of people who want to just come and take ijaz of hadith from him. So he graduated from Deoband and then he went to another place in India in the Abel, 
uh, there's a big madrasa there. He taught there as well, and there's lots of major, uh, you know, like senior scholars who are his students actually. Uh, and then he, from there, he taught there for a while, and then he moved to Africa, southern Africa, in a country called Malawi. Malawi is next to South Africa. I've been to Malawi, I've been to South Africa, both places. I think he was an imam there for seven, eight years. I mean, I don't know all of this because I wasn't born. Some of my siblings were there. Um, but uh, yeah, he was an imam in Malawi for seven, eight years. Uh, and then after that, in the 70s, like I said, 1976, he was invited by people here in Leicester, UK. And he established a masjid here, which is, we are in Dar al but just across the road, the masjid, Jami' Masjid. And there's a lot of madrasas and, you know, different uh, buildings here and different uh, schools and madrasas, etc. So he's been since 1976 till, what is it, 2022 right now. So we are like 46 years. Uh, and this is why, you know, because of his services to this city and to this area, uh, we have a Sheikh Adam Square here, uh, officially by the government, by by the not the government, but maybe the council. The council yeah, sorry, yeah. the the local council. They said that we need to name the square here called Sheikh Adam Square, and uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, he's worked for many many years in one place. Like a lot of people don't stay in one place; they move from here to here and there. So that's basically my father in a nutshell. And uh, uh, Mashallah, I mean, I I've seen him since childhood. Very pious very pious pious individual is always reading reciting i mean i've not seen anything except you know him always reciting quran every day and doing dhikr and like i remember when i was a child that's what he was just the only thing he does at home is either read or you know write but it's mainly ibadah even his writing uh, is not much books etc but he's more into ibadah a lot of ibadah he's always reciting quran always doing worship of allah since those days that i was young i saw that as well i grew up uh, seeing all of that uh, and my, my mother, Hafidah Allah, may Allah uh, preserve her, she's also alive, maybe late 70s or something. Uh, so she's, alhamdulillah, she's also a uh, very pious individual and uh, she's, you know, alhamdulillah, supporting my father all, the, all this time. Uh, she used to teach in the beginning, some girls, etc. in the madrasa, but then she retired after that. But, um, you know, she's, the energy at home is my mother's, you know, everything is like she's, she looks after the whole family, my father, all the children and all the grandchildren and great grandchildren now. But she is like the absolute, the energetic woman, you know, and from childhood we've seen her, she's always, you know, mashallah, being very energetic and, and even this right now, this age as well, she's got a lot of energy and interest and she needs to know everything, who's, what's happening, what, who's teaching where and who's going where and, you know everything about every aspect of uh, the madrasa and everything so but alhamdulillah so th these are my parents and uh, i was born like i said in leicester i won't say which year <laughs> okay because that's something i don't want to give away <laughs> Lord, every time this is the thing every time until now for the last 10 15 years every place i go people ask how old are you and i always I actually tweeted about this as well uh, and uh, I said, Imam Imam Malik, somebody asked Imam Malik, how old are you? He said, Aqbil ala sha'nik, mind your own business. Not in a rude way, but it's like, do more important things. Aqbil ala sha'nik, and carry on doing what you have to do. This is not an important question. Then, somebody asked Imam Shafi'i. So Imam Shafi'i, he said, I asked my teacher Imam Malik, how old are you? He said, Aqbil ala sha'nik. So I tell you the same thing as well, Aqbil ala sha'nik. And then I heard that there's a whole, that student Imam Shafi'i, somebody asked him, how old are you? And he said, Aqbil ala shanik. And then he, somebody else asked him, how old are you? He said, Aqbil ala shanik. All the way down until today, there's a sheikh in some way in Medina or Mecca or I don't know where. Someone said, where you can go to him and get this whole musalsal, continuation. Musalsal bi qawli kulli wahid minhum Aqbil ala shanik. So you go and ask him, how old are you, sheikh? He said, Aqbil ala shanik. Because I asked my teacher, how old were you? How old are you? And he said, Aqbil ala shanik. And because he asked his teacher, mm. all the way to Imam Malik. It's a continuation. Mm. But anyway, um, yeah, I get asked this a lot. Sometimes people say, like, you've been, uh, you know, I mentioned sometimes some things that, oh, yeah, this was 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I taught this course. So then they start scratching their head, you know. So people, let, let them keep on thinking how old, you know, it's just, it's, because, you know, uh, if, if they think that you're, older than what you are 
Then mm. that's also an issue. And if they think they're younger than what you are, that's also an issue. But anyway, so yeah, this this is uh, my family, mother and father. And I have siblings. Um, just quickly, not too much detail. But uh, I am the youngest of five brothers and sisters. So all of them, alhamdulillah, all graduated as scholars. My eldest brother, Sheikh Mulana Ahmed Ali, uh, is much older than me in age and seniority and ilm and everything. And uh, uh, he uh, graduated from Dar al Berry in the UK. He also uh, stayed in the company of Shaykh Zakaria Rahimahullah and he also studied a bit in Pakistan and he's written a few books in Urdu and uh, mashallah and he does a lot of you know charity work and he goes to Turkey and places like that and uh, he's, he also resided in Canada and he established a madrasa in Canada before as well and then my second brother after that uh, Sheikh Mawlana Imran he's also mashallah you know he's been here for many many years he's an imam of the masjid here he teaches in the madrasa he's actually the principal of the madrasa he runs the whole Madrasa that we have here. He also graduated from Dalambari. And then I have two sisters after that. They're both also involved in the Khidmah of Deen, teaching, running madrasas, etc. Uh, and then I am the fifth, the youngest out of all of them. And, and all of them have children as well. And a lot of them have all memorized Quran and, you know, um, uh, not just memorized Quran, but they've graduated as scholars. So a lot of my nephews, nieces, that, you know, they're all graduated as scholars. Many of my nephews look older than me as well. <laughs> now, but uh, alhamdulillah, so th this is the, the small family that, uh, or not the small family, the big family that I have. Sheikh, just to uh, add on in terms of your name, I guess a lot of listeners, they'll, they'll know you as uh, al Kawthari. Yeah. Where, where does this come from? Where does this title come from? Yeah, this also, people have asked this question quite a bit as well. Where does al Kawthari come from? It's not a family name. Um, <clears throat> it's not a surname. That's why none of my family members, uh, brothers, or anyone use they use al kawthari So I only use it. And the reason was, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. One reason was, you know, when I was studying back in Syria many, many years ago, we'll talk about that later, I published a book. So when I published a book, and the publishing house said, look, what's your name? How can, you know, as an editor of the book, what can we put? So I said, Muhammad bin Adam. So he said, what's the last name? You need something. Muhammad bin Adam, what? Uh, I don't like to use the normal subcontinent surname that we have because it's not common anyway. Uh, so I said, Muhammad bin Adam is enough. So he said, no, we need something. A nisba, an attribution to something like, shall we, shall we put Al-Hindi, the Indian? I said, I'm not really. I haven't even seen India properly yet. I wasn't born. He said, shall we put Al-Birtani? You know, the for British, and that but that Britani just doesn't look that nice, you know, um, on, on an Arabic book. So then I was thinking, what there has to be some sort of nisba, like is there a madrasa or is there like some sort of Islamic attribution that you can have? Because you see, in the subcontinent, and not just subcontinent, many parts of the world, like those who study in Azhar are called Al Azhari. They put Al Azhari after the name. In Dar al Deoband Seminary, the people who have graduated there are normally known as Al Qasmi because Mawlana Qasim Nanotwi Rahimahullah he was the founder of the Dar Ulum so attribution to him Qasmi uh, there's Madahirul Ulum in Sahrampur which is a famous madrasa those who graduate from there are called Madahiri so it doesn't have to be a place as well those from Mecca, Makki, Madani, Basri, Kufi you know even in the olden times everyone used to Imam Bukhari is from Bukhara everyone had these attributions so I was thinking what attribution to use so then this al Gauthari came in mind and there was a reason is because one of the places uh, I studied it's not an official but the Darul Berry that I studied it at it's not an official like uh, you know title or attribution used for those who graduated from there but in the olden times there was some kind of reasoning that you know it was just thought of that those from here from here can be called as al Gauthari. there's some story behind it but nobody ever used it. So I thought, you know, maybe, you know, that's one place maybe I graduated from, I could use it. And I just used it. And then there was also another reason was I used to, at that time, I was reading a lot of books of Imam Muhammad Zahid al Kawthari, Rahimahullah, great Egyptian scholar. Um, even though, uh, you know, some of his ways of writing certain things you can disagree with, 
which I can maybe talk about later. That doesn't mean I agree with everything that he says and the way he says it as well. Especially he could have said things in a better way. That's why Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda, a student, who is, mashallah, very balanced, an amazing scholar, and we'll talk about him later, uh, one of my favorite scholars. In a very balanced way, he's explaining everything. So anyway, I, I used to read a lot of his books. So I had that in mind as well. And this is why I just started. I just used it in the beginning, not as I thought I would officially, officially use it. But then it became so common and so famous that it just became used so much. And now it's everybody. Muhammad ibn Adam al-Kawthari. So, yeah, that's the reason why. Um, so this is my name, like I said, siblings, brothers, uh, sisters, all graduated scholars, my father as well, mashallah, uh, old scholar, uh, imam for a uh, long time. And uh, and also, like I said, in my family, brothers and sisters, their children, nephew, nieces, many of them all have memorized the Quran or graduated as scholars as well, inshallah. Inshallah. So, uh, in terms of uh, your childhood, could you describe where your studies began as as a, as a youngster, as a, as a child? Um, I guess your father, uh, Sheikh Adam, must have had a huge uh, impact and influence in that. Could you kind of like describe briefly about um, what impact he had and where your initial early days of studies began? Mm. Yeah, so... I was born in this city, so childhood childhood was spent in this city. Not just in this city, this area. Where we're sitting in Dalifta right now, outside, this Sheikh Adam Square is where we used to play. I grew up here as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, a mischievous young boy, you know, messing around and playing around. And there might be some people who used to play around with me in this area. They might be watching in, the, in this, I don't know. Have you seen the sign that says no ball games? Mm -hmm. That was because of us. The police, because the police used to be, there used to be a police station there, then they moved. So they used to come and tell us that you're not supposed to play football here. Mm -hmm. used, we used to play football in this, it used to be a park, small car park. We used to play one touch football. You know, there's benches there, so the benches was the goal. I grew up in this area. Every day I just come here, come on. Let's, and we used to play here. So the police used to come and say, look, you can't play here, these cars are going to be parked here, you might hit someone's car. They used to confiscate our ball. I used to tell every, all the young kids, I said, don't worry, I'll go and get it. So I used to be the chief head of the gang. I used to go to the police, oh, you're not going to play again, you know, this cost a lot, it's my ball, please give us a ball. Okay, next time don't play here, yeah, don't worry, we're not going to play. These are when I'm seven, eight years of age. So then after that, they had to put that big sign, no ball games. So this is the area that I grew up in, the city of Leicester. Uh, this, this area, uh, you know, there's like these buildings here, I used to climb on top of these buildings and, you know, you have this water thing here, what do you call them? Uh, like, brooks or something, like, yeah, I don't know, like, brooks, yeah, yeah. yeah, this river. We used to go down and we used to go underneath the tunnels from here all the way, like, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, you know, th those were the days when we never used to have these gadgets and, you know, PCs and laptops and tablets and computers. So people played naturally. You played naturally, you exercised outside. Children used to play all day outside here in this car park or this park here. From morning till evening, there used to be children playing. Full. All the children used to play there. Now you hardly see children. Everyone's inside, indoors. So, so my childhood was in this area. Now, as you mentioned, my father, of course, I think one of the great things um, that I great ni'mah of Allah, blessing of Allah and uh, I feel it's, uh, it's a unique ni'mah of Allah which I can't thank Allah enough was from a young age I saw and witnessed great shuyukh, scholars, ulama in my house they don't come that often now because my father's gone old but at that time frequenting my house and I think that plays a massive role in how a child's upbringing takes place. Two things, one is I saw a lot of books. So like we have a lot of books here. So I grew up seeing like books. I can still until now remember what color what book was. And it, those books are still available by my father. His Ma'arif al-Quran, which is a tafsir of Mufti Shaifir, black cover with golden written Ma'arif al-Quran. I haven't seen it for years, but 
I saw it as a five, six, seven years old. There was a commentary of Hidayah called Ainul Hidayah in Urdu. My father used to use and he used to write lines on it in black cover, um, thick four volumes. Lots of his old books, because you see them regularly. So when you see this, you know, it has an impact on you. So a lot of books. And the other thing was, like I said, lots of shuyukh and ulama mm. from different parts of the world. I've sat in the laps of lots of lots of great scholars. Sure. Um, I mean, I can think of some, so if I can mention some of the names that I can remember from the top of my head right now. <clears throat> um, great, great scholars who've come to our house. There was somebody called Sheikh Mufti Mahmoud Al Hassan Gangohi. He was a Grand Mufti of Dar Ulum Deoband. This is not, not to be confused with Mulana Rashid Ahmed Gangohi, Rahimahullah, the teacher of Hakim Ulum and Mulana Shulitan, Rahimahullah. Not him. This is Mufti Mahmoud Al Hassan Gangohi. We have his Fatawa Mahmoudiya, it's behind me here. You know, uh, these are 20 volumes. This is just volume number 12, Fatawa Mahmoudiya. There's 20 of these. These are all his Fatawas. Faqihul Ummah. Mawlana Mufti Mahmoud Hassan Gangohi Nawar Allah He passed away in 1996. He passed away in 1996 or 90, 97, I think. But he came to the UK many times, and uh, I will talk about it later. But he came to the Darul Bari, and we actually finished our, you know, Bukhari Khatam with him and took Ijazah from him in all six books, and we read the final hadith by him. But he came here in 87. Uh, he came to Leicester. He stayed at my father's house, stayed there for three days. Uh, also, Sheikh Mawlana As'ad Madani, the son of Mawlana Hussain Ahmed Madani, rahimahullah. He used to come every year to the UK, come and see my father. He used to come here uh, regularly. Uh, and then, also, some unique great scholars. I remember once the Imam of Haram of Mecca, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdullah Subayil. He's passed away now, rahimahullah. He was Imam of Haramain, Mecca and Medina. Very balanced, humbly, but very balanced. Very balanced, good connections with subcontinent scholars. Good connections. He was very close to Sheikh Zakaria Rahimahullah as well. He came to the Rumberi as well. Uh, and he actually, we'll talk about this later maybe, uh, he he came to the Rumberi, I think, more than one occasion, and also some other masajid in Leicester and other parts. He came to the UK a few times. He used to lead the Isha prayer. He was the sheikh of most of the imams of Haram today, uh, his, their teacher. For many years, good 40, 50 years, he was imam of Haram, Haram, of both Harams, but he used to lead Salah in Mecca, Isha Salah. Muhammad bin Abdullah Subay. Then afterwards, his son became an imam, or whilst he was alive, his son became the imam, but his son passed away before him in a car crash. Um, so he came. My father's house is just here, next street. I remember he came. Uh, they was there for a few hours, I sat in his lap uh, and then I read because my father told me that when he comes reading a nasheed in uh, Arabic so the, the uh, only Arabic nasheed that I knew at that time which I used to always read was the Burda now the Burda can be problematic slightly for somebody from Saudi Arabia because of certain words etc but I just read it and he was just hearing, mashallah, and you know, it's just, I don't know what part of the book. I think the main Muhammadun Sayyidul Kawnaini wa Thaqalain wa al Fariqaini min Arabi wa min Ajami, Mawlaya Salli wa Salim Daiman Abada ala Habibika Khair al Khalqi Kulihimi. So uh, I read that one uh, whilst he was there. Also, um, from the scholars that I remember coming to my house. There was a great Mufti of Pakistan called Mufti Wali Hassan Donki, Rahimahullah. He's actually a teacher of Mufti Taqi Uthmani and Mufti Rafi Uthmani, uh, a great scholar of Pakistan. I remember him coming to my house. Even Sheikh Islam, Mufti Muhammad Taqi Uthmani, Hafizahullah, my own teacher, he visited my father in 1987 for the first time. Just passed by Leicester. I saw him. I still remember the image uh, when he came. His brother Mufti Muhammad Rafi Uthmani rahimahullah, who just passed away many times he came and <clears throat> came to my house and used to sit with my father. But I'm not talking about even people older than them, uh, senior ones. There was somebody called Sheikh Mawlana Muhammad Yusuf Ludhiani rahimahullah. He was martyred in Pakistan. Um, he was a great scholar of 
hadith and fiqh teaching at the Jamiat al Islamiyah in Binori town, famous. Whenever he used to come to the UK, he used to say to all his hosts, when I land in UK, from the airport, first I need to go to Leicester, to Baba Adam's house. He used to call my father Baba Adam. I'm going to stay there one night, eat there, eat barn with him, relax, and then rest there, and then the next day take me wherever you want to take. And uh, he was an amazing scholar, uh, a student of Sheikh Zakaria, rahimahullah, and also um, a student of Dr. Abdul Hayarif, rahimahullah, Sheikh Mawlana Muhammad Yusuf Ludianbi, rahimahullah. He's, he has many books as well. I used to sit in his lap, mashallah, an illuminated face, illuminated face, a very pious and a very righteous and very knowledgeable intellectual scholar and alim. He has a book called, one of his famous books is translated into English, amazing book, Ikhtilafi Ummat or Sirat Mustaqim. The differences of the Ummah and the middle path. And he's talked about all the different groups. That's one of his amazing books. But he's written some other books as well. He, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Yusuf Ludiani, rahimahullah. So he used to, I used to see him every year. And then, you know, a lot of these scholars used to come for these khatm and Abu conferences from Pakistan, from India. So they used to all come on one weekend to my father's house. And they used to come here, they used to have one dinner here. So I got to know a lot of them. There was Sheikh Mawlana Abdul Hafiz Makki, rahimahullah. He just passed away in 2017 in South Africa, a student of Sheikh Zakaria, rahimahullah. Uh, yeah, I used to, whenever he used to come, he used to pick me up and put me on his, on his shoulder. He used to be friends with another sheikh. This other sheikh Mawlana, he's from Pakistan, but he was an orator. His name was Mawlana Muhammad Diyaul Qasmi. Yeah. Orator, like a famous orator. He's not a very uh, prolific writer or a teacher, but an orator, one of those you know, Pakistani orators. He was very much known for his public speaking. A lot of them were in tune and, you know, Allah says this and, uh, and it's like, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a thing in Pakistan where you become a master of being an orator and a speaker. So I became very close to him. I was like 9, 10, 11 years of age. I used to listen to all his cassettes and I used to, you know, because he was very nice, entertaining in Urdu. He was like my role, first role model. And he used to like, when he used to come, he used to sit to eat, he used to eat afterwards, he used to make sure I ate with him. And uh, he, he bought me gifts from Pakistan and things like that. And then they used to have this uh, khatm e conferences in the UK. They still have them in Birmingham Central Mosque. These were the, you know, when the Qadiani movement, they, they, they were in Pakistan, originally India, Pakistan, and then they were declared non-Muslims in Pakistan. So they fled from there, their head fled and came to the UK. And till today their head, they have this Ahmadiyya channel and things like that. Because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani was the founder, then his son became the head of, of the movement, then his grandson, now it's, I think it's somebody called Mirza, Mirza Tahir, and now it's his grandson, if, if I'm correct. I don't know, know his name. Um, grandson or great grandson. So the scholars from the subcontinent used to come here and they used to invite people from scholars from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and even from the Arab world, even the Imam of Masjid Nabawi, Sheikh Hudayfi, Hafidahullah, he attended one conference in Birmingham, Birmingham Central Mosque. He performed, he led Salah, he read two uh, sorry, two from the Quran and then gave a talk in Arabic which was translated into Urdu. Um, so a lot of these scholars used to come. So they used to come here. So this Mawlana Muhammad Ziaul Qasmi rahimahullah was a fiery speaker, orator, very, very popular, very popular. So he told me that you need, you need to read the Nasheed, the Naat. These conferences, they started first in London, in the Wembley Conference Center. You know, we have Wembley Stadium. Mm. Next to Wembley Stadium, in Wembley, there, there was a Wembley Conference Center. I don't know, I don't know if this, it's still there. I think houses about five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand people. And in those days, you never used to have too many programs. There's no online. So any major program, people are going in coaches and traveling from across the country, from north, south, from east, from the west. They're all going all the way to London. So he told me that I need to read Nasheed Nat. I, I still remember, there's a recording somewhere, 
there was Urdu Naad Kul Khatme Nubuwa Zindabad. You know, it's like I was nine years of age. And uh, I, I was, I remember I, I attended the conference. Now, the, con- the conference is like they've got a stage yeah, at the front. There's about 30, 40 major scholars of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, like some major, the Imam of Haram and, you know, you know even the local UK scholars, Shaykh Mona, Yusuf Mutala, Rahimahullah, and many, many scholars, major ones, the majority of them all passed away. And I remember, like, my other brother was told that, find me, and then I came from the back and from the stage, and I, I was short, I was a young child, nine, I'm still short a bit, but imagine nine years of age, like, I was, now, they, what they did was, I couldn't reach the, the mic, so they bought a chair and I stood on top of the chair. And Mawlana Zayal Qasmi Rahimahullah introduced me. And he said, look, this is a young child, nine years of age. Uh, and his name is Muhammad, but I call him. And he used to call me Mukhtasar al-Ma'ani. That, that, he used to give me that name. He actually said it in the program, the, the recording somewhere there. But I've called him out of love, Mukhtasar al-Ma'ani. Like Mukhtasar al-Ma'ani, I think what he was thinking was that you've got a lot of meaning in you, but you're Mukhtasar, you're, you're small, tiny, but you're... Uh, it's a book. Mukhtasar al Ma'ani is a book in, mm. in Arabic, Fasah and Balagha. You have Talkhis al Miftah, you have Mukhtasar al Ma'ani. And recently, Mufti Taqat Mani called me Mullah Mukhtasar. <laughs> so I'm all just Mukhtasar, every, everyone's calling me Mukhtasar, mashallah. So anyway, he used to call him Mukhtasar al Ma'ani. So he said that, that he's Mukhtasar al Ma'ani. I call him, his name is Muhammad, and inshallah he's going to read. So they put me on the chair and I read. Like nine years of age. Khatman, Ubuat, Zindabad. I remember. As soon as I finished, everyone, like the whole eight to nine thousand people, takbi, you know, people are clapping, and like people are crazy. He had to stop and said, enough, 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 everybody. Then I said, look, this is the living miracle of Khatma Nabuwa that even small children today, you know, something like that, he said in order. But I remember after that, when I was leaving, because people are leaving in coaches, etc., as all everyone's pointing, that's that child, that's that kid, that's the one who read the Nasheed, that's the kid. I still remember. So I was in the limelight from then, yeah, from nine years of age. So anyway, these were great scholars. And I remember when he used to come to my house, him and Sheikh Abdul Hafiz Makki, they used to both take in turns to pull me on the head, on the shoulder, and said, no, look, this is the better way to pick him up. This is the better way to pick him up. And um, they used to all kiss me on the forehead. And So I saw all of this at a young age, all these great scholars. And I used to imitate Mawlana Dayawal Qasmi Rahimullah's Urdu lectures. I never understood what they meant, because mm-hmm. I never used to understand Urdu. I had no clue what they were saying, but it was just tune and, you know, so I used to just imitate them. And I remember in childhood, I used to imitate a lot of the imams of Haram as well. You know, all uh, all these great imams of Mecca and Medina I used to love. So when I used to go for Umrah, I used to want to go meet all of them. Like, I used to know who leads Fajr Salah and who leads Dhuhr and who leads Asr and who's going to be where. And I used to go meet them and then I used to imitate all of them. So I remember Sheikh Salih bin Humaid, I think still the imam. Uh, used to read Fajr Salah and then you had people like Sheikh uh, so Dais and Shurayn they've been there for a long time they never age as well amazing Sheikh Shurayn has been there for so so long uh, since I was in my teenagers I can remember uh, Sheikh Sudais and Shurayn Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdullah Subayn there was Sheikh Ali Jabir uh, he's passed away Rahimahullah Sheikh Hudayf has been there for a long time and then there was Sheikh Abdul Mahsin Al Qasim and uh, there's all these great Imams of Haram so what I used to do when I was a child, I used to imitate all of them. Sheikh Abu Bakr Shatri as well, I used to try to lead like him in my uh, teenage years, 17, 18 years. I actually, when I met him recently, I said, how old are you? When I was a teenager, I used to come, copy you, you used to look like me now. Sheikh Abu Bakr Shatri, he's in the UK, you know, I think. I met him last year. Um, I said, when I was 17, 18, I used to listen to you. So, but one thing I used to do was, I used to do something in childhood as a joke, now, I don't know if that, that was just, I used to lead, I used to read Surah Fatiha in the tune, every verse with a different imam. So, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Adameen, like Sudais, and then Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, like Shulayim, Malik, Ya Umidin, like someone else. Which is, I think, it's just a bit of a joke and fun. If you're a child, if you do it, it's fine. When you grow up, you don't do that, something like that. So, um, this this was, you know, uh, my like, I used to like imams and the recitations. Sheikh Abdul Basit Abdul Samad grew up listening to him. I used to copy him as well. The Qira'a. Mm-hmm. I, I used to do it exactly like him. I mean, not exactly like him, but I used to, you know, he's, of course, a different level, but I used to try to copy him, imitate him. There was somebody else called Sheikh Antar, Qari Antar. 
Um, I used to copy him as well. Uh, and we used to have cassettes in those days, tapes, tape recorders and cassettes. So these were the great kind of scholars who came to my house. Um, if, I'm, if I mention most of them, there was somebody called Sheikh Azizur Rahman Hazarwi, Rahimullah from Pakistan. I remember he bought me a hat as well uh, as a gift. So look, I've also I've also seen Sheikh Al Hadith Maulana Zakaria Rahimullah. You know I, he never came to my house here, but he came to Darulam Berry, and my brother took me, and I was I think I, I don't know how old I was. I was about four or five years of age, and I met him and I shook hands with him as well. Um, Sheikh Al Hadith Maulana Zakaria Rahimullah Taala. Uh, so yeah, lo lots of these great scholars. Who used to frequent in my house, and so that was one of the greatest ni'mah I think uh, in my childhood. Uh, you also said you asked about you know how um, my father's influence in the study. So basically, I studied initially at home. I, I memorized the Quran. Alhamdulillah, I started memorizing the Quran at the age of six. I completed it at the age of nine, despite me not wanting to. But I remember like my father was very strict, like you know every day with school. So imagine going to school in the morning. And then coming in the afternoon and come, uh, like coming back at three, three, four o'clock, three thirty, and then straight learning. You know, uh, I used to have this quick like some drink, milk, or some you know uh, biscuits, and then learning. And then I used to go to the madrasa. So I used to study at home. Uh, my father used to listen to me, but then also I used to go and attend a hifth class in the madrasa as well. So officially, I can read again there as well. So at home as well as in the madrasa and, and I memorized the Quran at home. My mother used to really push me as well. She used to make sure time to read, time to you know. She used to listen to me. My mother used to listen to my Quran. I remember. Have you memorized your one page? And, and used to uh, listen to me. Uh, so yeah, I did and learned a bit of Urdu, etc. So a lot of the initial studies was at home by my father in the madrasa, my mother as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is basically the basic initial studies and childhood. Also, we I remember that we used to have in our local madrasa when I was growing up here, uh, we used to have these yearly annual programs. We used to call them jalsas, maktab jalsas, where the objective was twofold. Number one was that all those students, children who passed the exams, who, who came first or second or third in the exams, they were all given um, gifts and they were rewarded. So they used to announce in every class, class number one, class two, class three, this class, that class, who came first, second, third, and they used to give presents. In those days, the presents were like at a cutlery and I don't know why they used to give like a microwave and, you know, some <laughs> plates and things like that. Children used to take that home. Then they changed it because someone said that all of this, well, the children go and give it back. To, they go and give it to their moms in the kitchen. Then they changed it to calculators. I remember I got a calculator once and I was so happy I got a calculator uh, as a gift. So that, that used to be one objective of the jalsas and that, that's one thing that used to happen. And the other was that all the children used to participate in uh, conducting programs. So they used to read Qara'a, Nasheed, talks in Urdu and English. Uh, performances basically so I remember from childhood days every year I used to do a lot of performances you call them perform because children are performing mm. adults don't perform and this is you know when you say this person is performing that's not for adults adults they give a talk or even if they're reading the sheet they're giving they're calling people towards Allah it's mm. not a performance because the niya for children you don't have an intention niya it's just showing off and it's just even if it's not showing off for children it's just encouragement because you're six seven eight ten years old you're a child so this is there's a message in what i'm trying to say here that adults they don't perform so anyway i used to perform alhamdulillah every year i remember at the age of six was my first performance and this masjid here that we have here there used to be a pulpit member at the age of five or six i read my first qira of the quran i still remember i read first ruku of surah rahman screaming i was five or six i think maybe six i went right to the top third and I still remember I think there's a recording somewhere I've got some old tapes and then I gave talks in Urdu I gave talks in English I uh, did um, of course nasheeds on a regular regular basis nasheed was you know, I grew up doing a lot of nasheeds 
Even in those Khatm and Nubuwa conferences, I mentioned that the one in Wembley Conference Center in 19, that was in 1986, the Wembley Conference Center. The first time when I stood on the chair and, you know, Mawlana Zayal Qasmi, rahimahullah, he passed away in 2000, Mawlana Zayal Qasmi, rahimahullah, um, when he introduced me. But then after that, every year, I used to recite a na'at or a nasheed in those conferences. So 87, 88, 89, they used to have them in the Khatm uh, uh, in the sorry, the Wembley Conference Center. And then from ni- 1990 onwards, they moved it because I think the expenditure was a lot because you had to pay to hire the mm-hmm. halls. So they moved it to Birmingham Central Mosque. From 90 onwards, 91, 92, 93, I think they still have it. Every year they have it in Birmingham Central Mosque. So I recited not even in 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. Every year they used to tell me, till about 96 when I graduated from Dalumberry. And we'll talk about that later. And I remember one of the weekends, I think in, I don't remember, I think 87 or 88, there was a weekend of major programs. So on the Friday, Darul Umberi had a new masjid built, a new building, new facilities. So they were inaugurating the new masjid in 1987. That was a Friday. Saturday, there is a madrasa here in, in the Midlands, Madinatul Ulum in Kidaminista, which is a, you know, like a affiliation of Darul Umberi. So they had just purchased a building and they were inaugurating that building on the Saturday. And on the Sunday was the Khatm al conference in London. So I remember Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all three places I read an art. So in Friday, I never used to study in the Alumbari, but still I read an art. And all the great scholars from subcontinent, they had come for the Khatm al on the Sunday. They all went to the Alumbari on the Friday. Sheikh Mawlana As'ad al-Madani, rahimahullah, the son of Mawlana Hussain al-Madani, rahimahullah, he led the Jumu'ah. Actually, the Jumu'ah was supposed to be led by Imam of Haram, Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdullah Subayl, but last minute he had to cancel his program, uh, you know, his trip, and he couldn't c- come. So because he didn't come, because he was scheduled to lead the Jumu'ah, so then Mawlana Asad Madani led it, and then all these great scholars gave talks. And Saturday, they all went to Bir- near Birmingham, Kira Minister in West Midlands, and then they all went to Sunday. So, yeah, I've had this childhood growing up of reading the sheets and nods and performing and showing off since then. <laughs>